is formerly a, a researcher engineer at Zcash, one of my co-workers. Um, he's now the chief scientist at uh, Aztec, working on making um, ZK SNARKs more efficient. And I, I also want to note that he found the flaw in um, BCTV um, 14, uh, which was really quite significant and um, a significant um, contribution to the field, in my opinion. Okay, take it away, Ariel. Well, one second, sorry, just before we need a note taker. Oh, that's as true. usual. Yes. If um, anybody wants I to should, I should be um, sharing my screen as well. So, bear with me. If I... Uh, yes, carry on. All right, uh, should, should I start? Yeah, uh, yes. uh, okay. So, uh, like you might have seen, the uh, talk title changed a little, uh, or I guess the edit distance is large. Uh, I think sort of what happened in the last few months with our work on uh, Planck is that we saw that uh, what we, we then wrote in the proposal is sort of a, to an extent, an ad hoc special case uh, of something else. Uh, so that's why my, my focus is gonna be a little different than what we wrote in the proposal, but it's still basically the same subject, so I don't feel I'm uh, cheating. Uh, right. Uh, so, and this is based on uh, things Zach and I have uh, been working on in the last few months, mainly. Uh, okay. So, um, so uh, what sort of has been very successful in the last uh, few years? Uh, it's a little funny to call it the traditional approach. It's also relatively very new things. Is this approach of we have some program or statement uh, we want to prove things about. So we sort of compile it to a set of constraints in a certain language. And then this set of constraints, uh, it, uh, for example, the 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 you know the QAP reduction from the famous uh, GGPR paper uh, converts it to something in the world of polynomials, and then from that we get a, a snark proof, right? So this approach, the QAPR one CS approach, for example, uh, has been very successful. It gave us uh, Zcash. Uh, so I think what we've been seeing at and not just us, but what uh, we've been seeing uh, very strongly at Aztec in the last few months is that um, you lose, you can lose a lot in efficiency if you sort of, uh, you know, separate between the sort of the representing your program and going to polynomials. And it can really be worthwhile to work sort of directly with the polynomials when you're thinking how to represent your your program uh, and there is also a nice example of this of uh, uh, vitalik and i think others in the ethereum foundation are working on this uh, linked here uh, and if this all sounds vague i hope it'll be clear uh, soon so, uh, so sort of what I found to be a very good abstraction, uh, and I'll I'll give an examples of it. That that basically the talk will be two examples of it. Uh, after. So is this thing I, I call a ranged polynomial protocol? So what what does this protocol uh, look like? So you have some set of pre-processed polynomials 
that are sort of part of the protocol's definition. And also there's, as part of the protocol parameters, there's this special subset H uh, of your field. And now what does a ranged polynomial protocol look like? So it's a protocol between a prover and a verifier, like always. Uh, and you can think of it that in this protocol, there is also some ideal trusted party. And all the prover does is send uh, messages to this ideal party. And the messages must be polynomials of a certain uh, degree, predefined degree bound. So in, in these protocols, if the P sends something else, uh, then the ideal party rejects. The protocol is aborted. Uh, so the protocol goes on, the verifier maybe sends some random coins to the prover. Uh, the prover sends another polynomial to the ideal party, uh, you know, and so forth and so forth. And then at the end, uh, the verifier needs to accept or reject. So how he does that is he asks the ideal party, does some polynomial identity hold between these polynomials uh, the prover sent during the protocol and uh, the pre-processed polynomials on H? Right, so, so for example, uh, say the prover sent uh, F and there was one preprocess G, the verifier can ask in the end of the protocol, hey, is it true that for every X in H, uh, F of X squared equals G of X? So that's what the verifier does. And then the verifier accepts if and only if uh, uh, the identities held. See, I wrote if some ident it can be multiple identities. Uh, it doesn't have to be just one. Uh, all right, and what I found to be a very good um, here's what I found to be a very good measure. Of, of such protocols. And I want to say also par part of my motivation, uh, would, which will become more apparent later, is you know, we've had we had these these questions and we wanted to get smart people to work on them, you know, not necessarily cryptographers. So part of this was trying to sort of find a crisp, uh, appealing algebraic way to 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 say are you know the questions we care about that would interest maybe a mathematician or computer scientist uh, that is not a, a cryptographer. So so here's sort of how we me measure the complexity of a, a good measure of the complexity of these protocols. So and I'll give an example of this uh, if, if you haven't seen this stuff before I'm sure it's very abstract right now. So uh, let D capital D be the maximal degree of, of an identity the verifier checks when the protocol is executed with an honest prover. And now let uh, D of P be the sum of the degrees the prover sent plus the degree of this identity minus the, the size of H. And uh, why, am I, why am I defining something like this? Because uh, sort of what, what you can show is uh, what's been very useful in, in several works uh, re very recently is that you can take such an abstract protocol with an ideal party and compile it to uh, these zoom controls are driving me 
insane. How do I not see it? Let's see, hide floating. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can compile such an uh, abstract protocol with an ideal party to like a real protocol with security in the algebraic group model. And the prover complexity is going to be very close to this D of P. And what, why is this the case? Uh, basically, you use this, uh, I mean, today there are more various polynomial commitment schemes with various trade-offs, but you use, use the Cates of Rucha Goldberg polynomial commitment scheme. Basically, that's the proof. Uh, in a little more detail, what you do is P, you know, every time P in the ideal protocol sends like this polyno whole polynomial to the ideal party, he's in the real protocol just going to send a commitment to this polynomial uh, to the directly to the verifier. And he's also going to send a commitment to the sort of the quotient polynomial that shows the identity is satisfied, right? This C over ZH is only going to be a polynomial and not a rational function if the prover is not is correct. And then V is going to check basically the identity uh, at a random uh, challenge point. So yeah, if there, I don't know how the format is. You feel free to uh, shout out questions. Uh, could you could you elaborate a bit more on uh, this degree of the identity and like how you're computing the difficulty? You're basically saying that the sum of the polynomial, the degree, so the sum of the degree of the polynomial sent by the prover minus um, H, which is the set in which I'm testing, plus D. Yeah. I don't know what it is. What is the degree of an identity? Uh, uh, so, for example, I mean, I'll... I'll give an example next, but for example, say F has degree N and, the, and G has degree N and the identity is F squared minus G, then I count, I, I count the composed thing. So F squared is like 2N. I think of it as like capital D will be 2N. Sorry, thank you. I was writing down what you were saying. Cool. Yeah. And and again, the idea, right? The idea is that, well, I'll give an example. Uh, more examples next. Uh, uh, so yeah, I'll give a concrete example of this soon. But feel free to ask another question also now. Uh, all right, so let's let's look at a concrete example that's very useful. Uh, Multi-set equality check. So first of all, let's forget about the polynomials for a sec. Uh, let's say just I have two vectors of length three, and I want to check if they're equal as um, multi-sets. Right, so I want to, to check if b1, b2, b3, a1, a2, a3 are the same, uh, except maybe in different order. So, uh, a nice thing is that this was uh, uh, used, for example, in this uh, Bayer Grotz work that, that uh, uh, Plonk uh, gets inspiration from. Uh, so, an, a nice way, a nice thing is with randomness, you can easily reduce this to a single product check. So how, how do we do that? Uh, we choose some random gamma in our field. And now we compare the products of all the A's and the product of all the B's uh, shifted by this gamma. So right, this randomness is necessary, right? Otherwise we could have two things that are different as multi-sets, but their product is the same, right? We could have A be all ones and B be like half, one, two. Uh, but after you add this randomness, so, so what happens? So say they are equal as multi-sets, so definitely their products are equal, and still their products are equal after you shift everything by a gamma. And on the other side, say, 
they are not equal as multisets. So then you can show easily with the schwartz zippel lemma that with high probability, uh, it says different in sets, it should say as multisets, uh, the products will be different, right? Because it's sort of, if you think of gamma as your variable, if they're different multisets, you're, you're sort of evaluating different polynomials at this random point gamma. So with high probability, you'll get different things. Okay. Uh, All right, so going back to polynomials, um, uh, the uh, right in polynomial language, what we'll want to do is say we have now two polynomials. Uh, we want when we have this special set H, we want to check that the the set of F's values on H is equal to the set of G's values on H. Uh, and let me, uh, a brief interlude on multiplicative subgroups. So it's usually conveni convenient to, to take your set H to be a multiplicative subgroup. So what does this mean? It means we, we have some alpha of order N in the field in our set uh, H is just the, the powers of alpha. Um, so, and one particular thing that's useful is usually to look at the Lagrange base of H. So this just means we look at these polynomials of degree small, n smaller than n that are sort of indicator polynomials of the set H. So, for Li is the polynomial such that on alpha to the i, you get one, and on alpha to the j, you get zero for all the other j's in n. And one thing that's nice about multiplicative subgroups is that these Li's will have very sparse representations, so a succinct verifier can compute them um, him himself. Can, can I ask a question now? Yeah, yeah, of course. If, if I have a multiplicative subgroup where uh, uh, of this form, then uh, I'm in a ring, no? You and are I, in a field. And n is uh, smaller than p. Yeah, so n, right? n is some divisor of uh, p minus 1. Right, okay, sorry. Yeah. So you will have, uh, yeah. And this doesn't cause problem with a uh, with a multi-set equality check, for instance, that you did before. So uh, I'm going. The question is how I'm going to use. I'm going to show you right now next how when H is of this form, it's easy to do a multi-set um, check. Um, so so right going back to our multi-set check, what we saw with this random gamma is that we can reduce the multi-set check to comparing uh, these products, right? So in the, when we do the multi-set check, this F and G you're seeing here is, is not gonna be like the original F and G, it's gonna be the F and G modified, shifted by this random gamma. And now we, need, we wanna compare like their, their products. And a, a nice thing that is sort of the backbone of, of uh, the, the Planck snark is that when H is a multiplicative subgroup, there is an extremely concise uh, range protocol for, for comparing the products. And here's how it works. So uh, the prover is going to compute some polynomial Z that accumulates the, the products. So it's this polynomial Z, it's gonna start at one, and then at the i point, it's gonna accumulate the, well, the ratio of the, of the products 
uh, up, to, up to like I minus one. And, and now uh, the, the prover is going to send this, uh, this polynomial to, to the ideal party. Uh, and now, so what does the verifier do, right? So again, to remind you of the definitions, what is the verifier allowed to do? The verifier is allowed to say, does this polynomial identity hold on all the points of H? That's the questions the verifier is allowed to ask. So first thing, the verifier wants to, to check, hey, does really Z of alpha equal one? Uh, but he's not allowed to, to ask, he needs to ask something on H. So, so, what the, so, so, so V asks, does L1 times Z of X minus one equal zero on H? And notice that that's exactly equivalent to uh, checking that Z alpha is equal to one, right? Because this L1 is gonna be zero on all the points of H except uh, alpha. So, so checking this on H is exactly like checking that Z of alpha is one. So that's the first thing that V checks that L, Z of alpha is one. And the second thing that the verifier wants to check that really this Z is really accumulating the values of F over G. And here's like this, the multiplicative subgroup behaves really nicely. Uh, the verifier asks it like this. He, he asks, is if I look at the next value of Z, like Z of alpha X, is it always equal to the current value times F over G? And, uh, you know, you, it, it takes some time to maybe think about, but, but you, can, you can see that if these two identities uh, hold on H, it, it really implies that uh, the product of F is equal to the product of G. Because sort of, we're, we're starting accumulating at one. We are really accumulating the values of F over G. And, you know, the, the group wraps around, so, right, uh, uh, alpha to the n is just, uh, sorry, alpha to the n plus one is just, is alpha again. So we, we go back, we're accumulating, and we're really ending up again at one when the group wraps around. So it means that the product of f is equal to the product of g's values. Uh, yeah, any, any questions, any more questions? Uh, uh, when you're um, yeah. uh, when you're measuring the max degree of an equation, that's uh, the sum of the uh, degrees over each variable. Is that right? So yeah. Okay. So I'm going to exactly I'm going to exactly now. Let's do a, a an example of what I mean by this measure. So I claim here what is going to be this measure uh, d of p. So let's remind what, 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 what does this measure include? It, so first thing we sum all the degrees that uh, of the polynomials P sent, and he just sent this Z of, of degree N. Uh, and now we add the degree of the equation the verifier checked. So the verifier, the second equation is going to have degree 2n, right? Because we have this z times f, which will have degree 2n. And also on the other side, we have something of degree 2n. So that gives us another 2n. And, uh, but then we, we, and then we, we subtract h, which also has size n. So, so we get sort of that the complexity, the prover, it says complexity of this protocol is, is 2n. Uh, and yeah, I think so, you know, when you think about it like this, you can ask just any smart math person, hey, do you have like a protocol where this D of P is smaller and he, does, he or she doesn't need to care about uh, or 
cryptography or, or uh, uh, any, anything else. Uh, right. So, uh, uh, right. All right. And now let me uh, give you a second example of, of such a, where, I mean, I think this product check is, I don't think it can be improved much. But here's a place where I think there's, there's room for a lot of improvement and I want people to, to think of this question. Uh, and again, I want like, you know, smart math CS people to, to think about it, not just crypto people. So I'm really trying to put it in this sort of algebraic way that doesn't really have any crypto in it. So, so think of the following question. So now say we have some integer, positive integer m. And we have our, again, some polynomial f, some input polynomial. And we want to check that all of f's values are in some, are in this range one to m. So this is, uh, to anyone who's you know, built, built snarks, this is an, an extremely, extremely common uh, operation. Uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, the, the, this, this range is, is zero, one, actually. And uh, you know, in, in a lot of circuits, a lot of the circuit cost is, is these booleanity checks. Uh, but also now in these circuits that are coming up uh, for us at Aztec, for uh, in this uh, work of, of people at Stanford, of you know putting trying to do RSA accumulators inside a SNARK, uh, th there's a lot of need to do sort of non-native integer arithmetic, and then these you sort of divide everything to limbs, and you need to range check your limbs. So 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 so, and then suddenly your most of your, the cost you're paying is are all of my values uh, in zero to two to the sixteen or two to the thirty two so so this this is a, a very important sort of thing for for snarks and uh, let, let, let me conclude by showing you uh, a protocol for this problem uh, that is sort of a bit simplified version of, of something we have in a paper of Zach and I uh, Paper called Cloakup. You, you can look it up on ePrint. So, okay, and I'm gonna, you know, to make the make it easy uh, for myself and all of us, I'm gonna make a big simplifying assumption here that I know somehow that the F contains all these values, and really, I just want to prove that it doesn't contain other values. When you say f contains these values, or when you say f of x is in a, a certain range, you mean that the valuation of f is in a certain range, or something? So else? I mean, yeah, good, good. The uh, coefficients. For, what do you? What does thanks for mean? asking. Uh, maybe I didn't highlight. So what I mean, I have this special set H, and I'm looking at the set of f of x where x is an H. Okay. Thanks. And that's that's what I that's the set I care about. Okay, so here's here's how the protocol is going to work. Um, so uh, P is going to compute a sorted version. Uh, of f. So, what I mean by that is just going to compute a interpolate a polynomial that the values of on h are the same as f's. Uh, the, the same yeah. with multiplicity. Yeah, the same. Same here always means same in the multi-set sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, but they're going to be ordered. So. Uh, you're going to be monotonically increasing as I go from alpha to, oh, sorry, this should be less equal. This is a really bad typo, sorry. It should be S of alpha to the I less equal than S of alpha to the I plus one. So S is going to be 
like a polynomial with f's values, the same values on h, but monotonically um, increasing. And uh, p is going to send this uh, polynomial. And now, what, what is the verifier going to check? Uh, first thing, the verifier is going to do this multi-set equality uh, between S and F. So after V's done that, it now it now suffices to to check that S's values are in the range one to M. And that's going to be much easier because S is sorted. So explicitly, uh, how does that look like? So and I'm writing it here, you know, more informally. Uh, v is going to check that S of alpha is one. Actually, right, you're going to, how are you going to write it as a check on H? Like we saw before, you're going to write uh, L, L1 of, of X times S of X minus one should be zero should be zero on on all of h and you're going to check also that in a similar way with using lagrange polynomials you're going to check that s of alpha to the n is m and now you're going to check that really the values right if if we know these two and now we're, we we will check that the values are monotonic then it implies that all the values are in this range right so, so do you artificially add the values one and m so that um, you know that those exist in the set? The multi -set? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and and honestly, we're still when you really get down to the constants, we're figuring out the best way to do it. Like one way is to artificially add to the original f all the values one to m. Another option is to have a pre-processed polynomial T, like a table polynomial that has these values one to M, and, uh, and then sort of do the multi-set check between like T and F together and S, and then S needs to be a sorted version of F union T. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and- yeah, I, can, I can think of several ways to do it. Yeah, there's several ways to do it, and uh, we're still not completely sure in terms of the exact perf constants what, what is better when. Uh, right, so, so now what's left to check is that S is mon monotonically in increasing, and uh, right, this, uh, right, this corresponds to, to, to this check, that uh, maybe I wrote it in a bit, not the best way, but right, this is sort of the check x times x minus one equals zero. This checks that uh, s's next value minus s's current value is either zero or, or one. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, and now, okay, so what is the complexity? Let's again practice this sort of, this measure that I'm plugging. Uh, so what is, I claim it's, you're gonna get three N. Why are you getting three N? Well, let's see. So what, what polynomials is the prover setting, send, uh, sending? The prover sending this Z in the multi-set check, it's gonna give us one N. The prover sending this S that gives us another N. And now what, what is the, maximal degree of, of the constraints we're checking, we're going to have like before this, this 2n degree constraint. And also here, right, when we have this s of x thing uh, squared, that also gives us 2n. So the maximum is 2n. So again, we get like 2n plus 2n minus the n of the size of h, and, and we get uh, 3n. Uh, And uh, oh, I think I made this slide a bit too large. Uh, and again, like I said, to remove sort of the like they're they're asked, or to remove the assumption 
that really F already contains all these values, uh, you sort of need to use some pre-processed polynomial that, that does have all the values and, and look at uh, F union T, or you can sort of artificially add everything to F. Uh, or, but or I guess, I guess you can yeah. add them in steps and then you're in each step mm -hmm. you can um, to reduce it to um, checking that the difference is in zero to K and then that has degree dependent in K. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So, so really what we do is we, cause the thing is like, uh, right, if you're doing this thing, yeah, as part of a bigger protocol, you may have like a, like a four, say a four N constraint degree from somewhere else. And then you don't lose anything by also sort of have doing a four end degree thing here. And then that will allow you to, to check that the values of S are like rising by zero, one, two, or three. Uh, so, so you don't need like a table of everything just to like every third value. Uh, no, my, my, so, 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 uh, yeah, just to not, uh, confuse people on the, the meta point. Uh, it's okay if te technical points are confusing. I, my point is on sort of the meta level is not to show, well, look how uh, brilliant, brilliant this is. I think also maybe there were similar story ideas in, in works of Grot and students or, or others, but. So, of, sorry, I, I should uh, refrain from trying to optimize other people's protocols while uh, presenting them. Sorry. No, this is, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm presenting it so someone will improve it. Uh, 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 and, and you touched sort of the points I, I wanted to, to say, uh, but, but sort of like, right, this, this thing, it assumed that this M is, uh, is at most N. And yeah, we can, by increasing sort of this degree of this constraint, like allowing S to, to like, you know, go in bigger jumps than zero or one, we can go from a range to like of M to like three M, four M, uh, but like, I think the interesting open question here, which I, I wrote, but unfortunately it, uh, uh, the slide, I don't know if it'll appear on the next slide. Yeah, it, the slide cut it, I'm sorry. Uh, like a very interesting question I think is to, to, to manage to do a protocol with almost identical complexity where, where, where you can, uh, you can get a range of M squared. And, and really, for it to be interesting, you're, I mean, we're really like looking at constant here, so it has to be like almost identical because, right? You can you can right always represent a thing in, in the value m zero to m squared or by by two things from zero to m or one to m. So, so so you need something that will like cost you even less than this extra value in, in the uh, Yeah. So. That was my, that was my uh, talk. Okay, Thank you. can I ask? A, oh. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, is, Thank you, Ariel. Thanks. You, you, you mentioned, so you mentioned the potential application of like optimizing the booleanity checks. Yeah. Um, is this, is this better than doing something generic though? Because it still seems like the degree contribution is well, I guess the degree contribution is like three per variable that you want to Boolean constrain, right? Which is, I guess, just, so isn't it sort of similar to doing it in a generic way? Maybe it's a bit. So uh, I think this would be an over uh, kill for, yeah, for Booleanity checks, you can, you can sort of do the check X times X minus one sort of directly on your witness. Uh, this is really the challenge is, is when the range is, you want it to be long, you want it to be like two to the 32. So you can do operations on two to the 32 limbs without having to separately range check everything. Like if your range, yeah, if your range is smaller than the degrees that you're already having in verifier constraints, then you, you can just sort of direct, directly do the, a check x times x minus one and so on. Thanks.
so um, is this, I, I, I've seen things like this before in the context of Planck. Um, how general is it? Um, what other categories of proof system can it be applied to? Is, is there something that could be applied to um, almost any proof system with any uh, arithmetization? Or? Um, so, uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, sort of the way I'm, I'm thinking about it is it's not specifically Planck. You can sort of think of just your sort of programming with polynomial commitments. And uh, then you can do things like this. So, so as, a, as a spoiler, it's applicable to Halo as well. Um, we, we know that. Um, but that's, that's work that's being um, done at the moment. It's not ready for, to present yet. Cool. Uh, does anyone um, else have any oh. questions? Sorry. I, I have another question, if it's OK. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that when you were sort of apologizing for changing the, the title, um, that what you had proposed previously was sort of an, was in your words, an ad hoc um, special, special case. case or, yeah. Um, and in a way I see, I, I mean, I, I see what, what you mean, but what, wasn't it also actually quite general and wouldn't it subsume this, this as well, or? Maybe I'm asking a bad question by referring to something that was not in this talk in my question, but. Um, so, so uh, in this terminology, what, what was in the proposal uh, that, that we called the turbo plunk is like a protocols like this, where the verifier is allowed to do the following limited things. One thing is ask about an identity that doesn't involve randomness. Like in Turbo Plonk, the verifier can ask any identity that doesn't involve randomness. And we only allowed him to ask about one identity that does incorporate verifier randomness. And that was the particular identity of the permutation, of doing a permutation check between different witness values. So what, what was the motivation for that restriction in the original Turbo Planck proposal? The original Turbo Planck proposal is like, uh, well, I, I think it's what I, uh, so it's constraints that don't have randomness which is what we, I think, usually call the gates. And in terms of like a randomized, things that are randomized, we only allowed the specific sort of long uh, permutation. So, so you could, or another way, you, you had a program where you could check some polynomial between sort of the rows of the program, and you could do like some enforce and permutation, like the, the second value the fourth row is equal to the first value in the seventh row. So those were the two things you were, you had some polynomial that checks a transition control oh, so rows, so what, and you had some, some way to copy a variable from one place to another. So what you're basically doing here is deconstructing Planck um, by sort of breaking it down into something that could be used to reconstitute Planck. Um, uh, so the, the A train, Pr framework is more uh, general. It, exactly, the, that's what I'm saying. Um, yeah, because the, the permutation argument in Planck is just a special case, and, and so is the rest of Planck. Yeah. Can I, can I just ask my qual uh, just a clarifying question? So, like, for example, here you were talking about this multi set equality uh, 
which uses randomness in, in a way that is not captured by the proposal or uses like a randomized, uh, yeah, anyway. So, so if, I am, if I'm understanding it correctly, a special case of it was captured by the original proposal um but the, this is allowing you to construct it from scratch from something lower level is that right ariel uh yeah yeah like the multi-set check is part of the plonk permutation check uh but in the proposal we weren't allow you, allowing you for example to open the permutation box and just use that component Something else like rate check. Carla, do you want to speak, Carla? Yes. So um, this multi-set check, um, when you use it to check that a permutation is done correctly, you are sort of um, so multi-set is more general, no? That if the permutation is public, mm, you know, like multi-set allows you to check. There, if there is a, some secret permutation, whereas you're using it in a context where maybe the permutation is no, no? So maybe there is some room there, or maybe I'm not understanding it. Uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, I think they're incomparable and, and both are useful. So yeah, one thing, which is the, the central thing at Planck is check a public permutation which describes like the wiring of some circuit. And yeah, sometimes you need, you want a public permutation. Uh, so, sometime, cool. uh, so sometimes you want to be able to check just that there is a, a secret or that there is some permutation between, which is like, for example, important in this uh, range ch uh, check. So a, a generalization of both those is to check that there exists a permutation that uh, is committed to. So the, the commitment to the permutation is a public input. Is, is that just a straightforward generalization of this? Uh, well, well, here I there's no, there's no need to commit to the yeah. permutation. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, I wouldn't say if that's a generalization because here, yeah, here there's no need to. Right. To, okay. I see. Uh, that I mean that that is a that's maybe a different uh, thing that could also be useful. Uh, that I'm not. I wonder if follows from from this sort of stuff. Well, uh, an example of where that's useful, for example, is um, um, if you want to prove a secret circuit. Um, so you commit to a circuit, and then you um, you prove that. Um, so the, suppose you're doing something like sexy that that would use um, recursive validation to do that, but you don't. the The problem statement doesn't require recursive validation. Um, it just requires you to commit to a circuit and then prove it. But in any case, you don't have like basically the techniques that you have to deal with these two cases are the same. Or you have a specific? Or is there any way that uh, so so it's not uh, too different? It's a little. So say you have a fixed uh, permutation that yeah, actually in, in Planck, in a sense, you have a publicly a commitment to that permutation. Uh, actually, um, so th this is from a work of Baron Grot. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, the. I added this random gamma. Basically, you, you just need to add another sort of random shift that does depend on the permutation and then compare the, the products. Uh, so basically, you add the gamma and you also add some other random beta times like sigma of, of i. You add that to the i. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask. So. Um... This argument is different to the one used in the Planck permutation argument because it doesn't include beta. But why do you not need to include beta here? Uh, yeah, so, because I just care that there is some permutation between the sets. 
I don't, and uh -oh. that ends up in this product framework being like simpler. I see. I have another question is how successful have you been at getting other people involved so far? <laughs> At, at not, getting what? Other no, like you, you said like you, you're trying to generalize to like basically get rid of the crypto part so that you can um, get mm -hmm. other uh, people involved. So my question is, have you tried this um, already? I, I haven't tried it. Uh, I, I want to try it. So I want to, yeah, I'm just like, this is very new. Uh, I want to like, for example, maybe give this talk for some CS math audience that's not crypto and see if they look, find it an interesting question in itself. I, I, I mean, haven't tested that yet. It, even within the crypto community, separating the non-crypto part out is useful because then you, you're, just, you're just doing unconditional math proofs. You're not doing proofs about that depend on security assumptions or you may be, like me, you may be just bad at probability theory. Bad at what? Uh, bad at probability theory. I know for me, like once, I mean, for me, it happened uh, uh, very much with the Sonic paper that when, although, right, I mean, you should give credit to this earlier, a Buddha Latal paper, I think, also for that. But for me, yeah, when, with the Sonic paper, it suddenly became very clear that you can look at this polynomial commitment as a separate thing. Yeah, and that really opened uh, the door for these uh, uh, for some new constructions. Made can, it easier to, can, yeah, to think about it. Can I make one comment to that end? Mm -hmm. um, I think for me and probably, like I, I could only make sense of some of the things that were written and said in the context of my own experiences with implementing and using these functionalities in the context of larger protocols. Just like, for example, like to, to know kind of what is the correct sort of way to think about efficiency and, and so on. Like what Dara had said about, oh, well, you know, you can make the, the instead of having the difference being zero one, you can make the difference be bigger. It, you know, in the case that it's somewhere else you have lying around already, a higher degree polynomial, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that might be just a barrier to having people effectively. Um, I, I, maybe what I'm trying to say is there may be things about this uh, math rack D that uh, the real math math rack D, not the one that you wrote down, that may not be captured in the one that you wrote down. I don't know. If it, and also maybe it's hard to, anyway, anyway, I'll okay. just leave it. Can you explain in more detail how you derive the the, the cost metric? Uh, yeah, so let me maybe go back to where I wrote it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, right, so say, right, we have one of these protocols. And again, let's just to be sure we're following. The protocol is the prover send a bunch of polynomials and the verifier asks some identity between them on H. So in the real protocol, the, the prover will send commitments to all the polynomials. So what's that going to cost the prover? It's going to save with the KZG scheme. It's going to be basically the sum of the degrees, because right to commit to something of degree n is like n group operations with kzg, or so, n plus so one. How, how dependent is that on kzg? Would we expect for other polynomial commitment schemes that it would be similar? Uh, so I'm not, I don't have it like fresh in my head. Dara, it's the same, for example, like in the HALO scheme, because it, it, it's just like doing yeah. a multi x you know, it's just committing to That's the coefficient, multi exping with the coefficients with some fixed basis. Right. So, so it's not quite linear if you use Pippinger, for example, but it's approximately. Yeah. Linear. Yeah. This some i degree fi should really be some i 
cost <laughs> of multi XPUF size degree FI. Yeah, You're I, I think it can be a little smaller than DEGFI. I've been trying to work out um, cost models for Plunk and Halo, um, so the, that's the context of my question. Um, I, I'm all in favor of crisp cost models um, because that's what allowed us to optimize sapling. The, the fact that um, the cost of an R1CS circuit is basically just the number of um, R1CS constraints was incredibly helpful. Um, I, I know that that by itself is an approximation because it doesn't include the witness computation and the the size of the um, linear combinations, but it's it's a close in it's close enough for engineering work, and that's what you need. Well, I mean, the I mean, I guess the question here is: it a close enough heuristic that to commit to a bunch of poly, in in all the schemes we know, is it more or less true to say that committing to a bunch of polynomials is sort of linear in the some of their degrees is like grows li go grows with linearly with the sum of their degrees. Okay, yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, and the the rest of it, the I think I get the minus h, but what's the uh, plus d there? So it's really the d minus h is is one thing. So okay, so right, so how how is the real protocol going to work? Uh, the prover is going to send all the commitments to the polynomials. And now the verifier wants to check uh, the identity on some random point. Now, you want to check the identity on, on H. So, right, how do we always do that? Like, if the identity holds, then it means that, like, this identity thing is divisible by ZH, by the polynomial that's zero on H. So, what does the prover do? The prover also sends uh, the commitment to this quotient polynomial, like C over ZH what's going to be the degree of that quotient? It's going to be the degree of the identity minus H. So the D minus H is the, like the commitment to the quotient polynomial. And, and here I might add, Dara, if it's probably of interest to you, this part is specific to KZG because this is the cost of producing the opening proof, which, uh, you oh, know. Oh, right, so, so yeah. Um, no, I, this is not the quotient. So actually, I, I haven't. I've, for simplicity, I've oh. ignored the opening cost. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, okay. Uh, this is, and I'll, I'll say in a second why, and you can, you know, argue, argue, uh, disagree. But no, right. So, so before the opening, right, you need to send the quotient, right, in Marlin or Plong or right. There's some quotient polynomial that you need to send a, a commitment to. And, and then you're gonna compare to open at a random point, is this equal to the quotient times the H on a random point? Yeah, so that uh, I, I didn't include the opening cost and roughly it's because these, I think Reese did all these works on batching, including the work of mine with the uh, uh, Bonef, uh, Drake and Fish it's not totally accurate, but basically they seem to show that, you know, however many things you need to open on however many points, it's not that much more expensive than just opening one thing on one point. So it seems not I, terrible to ignore the opening cost, but I don't know. I mean, it, it, it kind of is a little bit terrible because in Halo, for example, you, you have to pay that cost at the end. Um, yeah. The, 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 the reason I the reason I brought it up in particular is because in it, it makes sense I think in KCG because they're the um, the cost of like you know some component of this math rec D like the D minus H the cost of D minus H is is proportional to the opening cost but um, in Halo it's it's it is also proportional but the constant is much worse because the opening the commitment opening is is not just a multi x but something less efficient. That's right. Anyway. And 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 Dara, it all, it, just while I'm talking to you, <laughs> it also I, I, there's an interesting optimization that shaves. We got it to be like 20%. I think it could be like 30% off of the um, opening uh, cost for for that the D log uh, polynomial commitments. Oh, excellent! Talk excellent. Talk, to me, talk yeah. to me about that later. Thanks. I, I don't know how much time is left, but uh, I could I could I have I could say a few words about the kind of the cost model of this um, in the context of Plonk. Um, if that would be useful. 
Um, yes. So um, when it comes to like, integrating this into Plonk, um, uh, we can kind of reduce this into basically asking the question, how many gates is this going to cost us? Um, so what we, what we, um, this, this turbo plot construction we have um, is it differs a little bit from the um, plot described in the paper because we use kind of four wires per gate instead of three because we just found that's a lot more efficient. Um, and so let's say now you have a gate, we have, some, we have some wires and you want to range check some of these wires using this, using this, um, this um, eight range protocol. Um, you don't need to commit to any kind of new, um, like you, you're already committing to a quotient polynomial as part of Planck. So the commitment to your quotient doesn't, as for the, for the subreddit, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, you're already committing to uh, the witnesses, because they're wires in your gate, um, that you'll assume, this, um, which we can assume you're going to be using in some kind of arithmetic expression that like that gate is doing useful work. So, um, uh, doing a range check on top of that is kind of free. Um, where, where it does cost is um, you need, to, you need to, to commit to this kind of sorted representation of all the, all the wires that you're range constraining, um, which means you kind of, you need to add gates into your circuit, um, which contain um, duplicates of every single wire that you want to range constrain. Um, so effectively, in terms of the number of gates it costs, um, every range check costs you one quarter of a gate. Um, in terms of um, the extra cost for evaluating these gates, um, what you add, so in, for, for non-pairing friendly commitment schemes, where the number of polynomial openings is important, uh, this adds, um, I believe it adds five, um, because in the original Planck, we, we, uh, our permutation argument, um, uh, we have this, this concept of an identity permutation, which we need to, which we need for our copy constraints, um, which is um, just a degree one polynomial uh, that can be implicitly derived. It doesn't need to be committed to. But if you want yep. to do range proofs, then that, that identity permutation polynomial um, becomes non-trivial. So you need to commit to them, you need to open them. Um, for Plonk with four wires, there will be four of them. Uh, so, um, and on top of that, you need to commit to um, a kind of a selector polynomial that you use to, to kind of activate a gate which validates um, the, um, the range constraint condition that basically you have a sequence of wires that are um, uh, where the values are increasing by zero or one, uh, or, or in our case, zero, one, two, or three. Um, mm -hmm. um, so effectively, yeah, it's four extra five extra polynomial openings and uh, every range check costs you one quarter of a gate. Sorry, it's, so, it's uh, oh, go ahead, Gary. Um, so you say every range check, uh, how does that depend on the, the range that you're checking in, any, in each case? I, oh yes, I, I did skip that part out. Um, so there is, a, there is a fixed cost um, that depends on your range because effectively um, for this, this generalized permutation to work, you kind of need a minimum multiplicity of one. Basically, if you're, if you're doing, for example, a, a range check between zero and two to the 16, then um, your kind of your sorted list needs to contain all of the values between zero and two to the sixteen. If you're checking increments yeah. of zero or one, um, so that very much depends on the maximum range. Um, but effectively, it's going to add. Um, you, you're going to need a, a dummy wires in your gate um, for every dis discrete value in your range. Um, you will need two dummy wires. That's then further reduced by a factor of three um, in 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 our protocol because. Uh, is like, 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 like you said, Dara, you don't just check that the, the values are increasing in steps of zero, right. one. Um, we, can, we can check the values increasing in steps of zero, one, two, or three um, without the overall degree of the identity being, becoming larger than the existing Planck quotient polynomial. Okay. So effectively, um, take your range, multiply it by uh, two, divided by three, that's the number of wires, um, and then you divide that by four to get the number of gates. So basically, take the table size, um, divided by the six. Um, and that's kind of a, a fixed number of gates you need to add into your circuit to support a range table of that size. So you can't use those gates for anything else or can you do that um, in parallow? And well, they, they need to be... Yes, it depends on how many wires you have. Sorry, the, we're, we're getting a little bit into the weeds here. Um, we should talk about this offline. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so um, I guess my role as moderate... Um, first of all, does, does anyone have any more questions before we get on to the the um, sort of standardization um, section and what the working group goals should be.
Okay. Um, so, um, uh, the first of all, do we do we think there is something here that is uh, worth setting up a group and standardizing? Um, is the first of all, is, is it sufficiently general? Um, and is it sufficiently useful? What do people think? Who is enthusiastic I, about setting up a group? Oh, uh, I was. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, were you going to say something? Um, I was just going to say, I think it would be, I think it, I was just going to say, um, it would definitely be useful to have, uh, like, it would be great if, you know, there was some clear spec of, of, of this whole thing, and especially if it were amenable to being sort of composable, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so that it would be easy to sort of you know, all the things that we talked about, oh yeah, you could pack all the limbs, you know, into the gate and then, you know, you, what Zach was kind of implicitly talking about so that it would be easy to kind of, um, you know, use all, all of this together in the context of uh, a system that also had other kinds of constraints and like, you know, maybe, yeah, I don't know. So, so for that reason, I think it would be valuable. So um, I, I guess I have a concern, which is that uh, we seem to be trying to design a proof system on the fly, uh, which is not how things are normally done as part of standardization. Um, we, we generally take things that have already been built. Um, I, I don't know whether that's just a concern that I have. Does, do you, does anyone agree with that or? Yeah, I mean, I think the original point sort of of this uh, discussion was about also looking at what are the kind of, what is the kind of format that Plunk or Turbo Plunk uses, which seemed a bit more maybe relevant to standardize in that context. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, Turbo Plunk is, it's, <clears throat> so, so my understanding is that there's not yet a, um, a fully worked out Turbo Plunk paper, the, the Plunk paper does not include it, um, mm -hmm. but it's the sort of thing that it, it's pretty close to being done. Um, so it would just need a little bit of extra work on it to, to make it something that could be standardized and peer mm -hmm. reviewed. Um, whereas this, um, this more general idea, um, yeah, it, it looks really useful and um, it's a good framework um, probably, but is it actually ready for standardization? To me, it seems, um, actually, I really like it. I think it can be very useful. I, 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 I believe it can be useful for more theoretical people. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that um, it's some, it needs to, to be tested, no? To see if it, like, this, this abstraction helps people get uh, simpler and, well, I think it needs to be dead tested if it's really useful. So, so should the focus of the working group um, be on the original proposal for TurboPunk? Uh, maybe we can do a poll about this. Um, Daniel, can you set up a poll? Yeah. Wait, one, one question is, uh, um, oh, sorry. Go on. Uh, um, so yeah, it's, one question is how does this fit into the general scope of const, you know, standardizing constraint systems? Um, yeah, the, uh, right? because here essentially we're saying, okay, like, uh, you know, there is this uh, old thing that, uh, I mean, until maybe one year ago or two years ago, the, the focus was was on these R1CS and, uh, and similar constraint systems. And this is like, you know, bringing up uh, other type of constraint system or maybe arithmetic circuits like constraint system. Um, uh, Ariel, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, sort of like I said in the first slides, it may not go together. 
it sort of uh, says maybe it's not the right thing to to look <laughs> at constraint systems if we're if we're doing. I, I mean, I, 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 I can look solely at the constraint. Uh, I can immediately see how I would use this, but I would use it for research. I, I, I'm not sure that it is ready for standardization, but we should do the poll. So um, just for the poll, before I click save, uh, I'm, the question is what should the working group focus on standardizing? And I, I have three, three answers. One is original Turbo Planck construction. The second is ranged polynomial protocols abstraction. And the third is what Dario suggested as the constraint system uh, maybe format or encoding. Um, I'm gonna. How does one vote? Is the poll there yet or not? Yeah, give me. I, I mean, uh, maybe maybe we should also add like none of this as another option, right? Okay. You, you know, if we think that, that yeah. for example, some people were mentioning that maybe we have to wait a little bit. Uh, yeah, look, I want to say I, I won't feel bad if uh, they say you say nothing should be standardized. Sort of like I said myself, uh, our realization in the last few months was that the turbo plonk was maybe a bit ad hoc and arbitrary, like a point to. Wait, I'm making this anonymous. Single Daniel, choice, yeah. Just, just to follow what Ariel said, I mean, yeah, this is something which has been like it is very new and it's still being very actively developed and the specs are always at the moment it's still a bit fluid um i guess one of the reasons why we're quite we, we'd like to we're curious if people want to um try and standardize on these is just because of one of the things is because of the sheer efficiency of these protocols um if uh because because we, you, you can do corporate arithmetic operations um like that you need in, in typical programs significantly more efficient than a system composed of multiplication and addition case um, it is very so the, the poll is in your screen. Please uh, answer the question and we'll see the results in a little bit. I don't really get the difference between the second and the third option. Yeah, we should so clarify second, that first. Go for it. It's a, sorry, what, what were the um, second and third? Ranged polynomial protocol abstraction what we saw today in the presentation. And the third one is the constraint system format slash encoding of the state. Well, well that, would that be the encoding of a Tevo Planck program or? Yes, I think that's what, what was meant by that. Okay, and in that case, I'm not seeing the distinction between options one and three, because presumably we would cover that as, if we tried to standardize Turbo Planck. Yeah, I see. I, I think okay. Yeah. Okay, so then let's just add the percentages of one and three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. We are a, a, a bit above 50%, almost 60%. Okay, good. Please do continue. Okay. A few more before we share the, the results. Anyone else want to answer the poll? Eight more seconds. I'm going to leave it up to two minutes. Okay, closing the poll. So you can see the results. Interesting. I think the clear winner is Turbo Planck. Um, slashing, maybe, maybe Turbo Planck focusing on the uh, encoding. Yeah, that, that's how I would interpret that. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because it's something that I think we discussed at some point in, in relation to ZK interface and how to mm -hmm. potentially generalize ZK interface a bit more to encompass uh, the Turbo Planck formatting, right? Or to, to kind of explicitly mention in which cases uh, R1CS like the translation from one to the other may have an overhead and, and things like this. So, so what I'm getting from this is that uh, we want to expand our focus from R1CS to um, more polynomial style proof systems. 
Yeah, that, that's also what I was, you know, mentioning. What I meant, like when I mentioned the constraint system, that like you know, I think the focus should not be much on the techniques, uh, but on the way we are expressing uh, these constraints, because the techniques are something that can be improved, uh, right? And, and this is still uh, an initial step, but. Here we are seeing an interest in formalizing statements and uh, constraints in, in, with polynomials. So, so there's there's definitely the possibility to um, define a kind of low-level language that uh, that would have the same role as R1CS, but for polynomial-based. I, I mean, I, I know R1CS proof systems are also polynomial-based, but but more Planck style proof systems. Um, and that would kind of depend on being able to get um, a nice abstraction that wasn't too dependent on the proof system, I think. Um, we thought about doing this when we were developing the Planck library in Rust, but we found that sometimes, I mean, going from the Plonk way of writing your constraints to the R1CS one should be pretty straightforward. But when you try to do the reverse thing, you find that you are losing sometimes a lot of optimization if you are not directly yeah. understanding how you put the rows in the program memory and all that stuff. So that's why we decided to, at least at the moment, don't support like a direct translation between R1CS and, and Plonk. I, and and some of the optimizations you can do for R1CS are directly harmful um, for a Planck style system. Exactly. And if if you maybe, rely, for example, on, on large linear combinations. Maybe we need an extra layer because there is this dependency on, on, on what's be behind. And at the same time, from a user point of view, you, you want to be able to speak yeah, that language that, that where you define your constraints. and. I mean, the, the, the mid layer that we have now is the gadget. And uh, that is more or less the, you know, the word that then you, you, you take somehow. So, so maybe the focus of the working group should be on trying to define an intermediate language that will capture the optimizations that you need to do for Planck-like systems. Right. With, with, a, with an eye to using it for more systems than Planck itself. Wouldn't we basically say like something in the lines of um, give me a like create essentially a compiler from a from a statement or something to like a polynomial representation, right? So that that's a different thing um, because so so that's asking for a sufficiently smart compiler that can um, optimize for your particular proof system, which is not what I believed we were talking about. Um, in the same way that you can optimize directly a, an L1CS program, which is what we did for Sapling, um, you need to have some way of talking about optimizations for um, Planck-like systems. Um, and you need that just in order to start talking about how to write a, a compiler um, because your your compiler will use all of these tricks that you've worked out manually um, in terms of the intermediate language um, Makes so sense. i do think that ha having a group of people who are interested in defining such a language is a useful thing to do um, do people agree with me on that uh, maybe we could have another poll about that. I think that would be quite useful, um, particularly because. I mean, we don't we don't necessarily need to have a poll if everyone just mm -hmm. agrees that this. That it, it, yeah, I, th I think it makes sense. I think the the point maybe is that we don't need to decide whether this standard is useful now, right? That's also part of mm -hmm. the working group. Like we have the working group created. Uh, we encourage uh, everyone to participate and to join the working group. At okay. some point. Of maybe in a few weeks after the uh, workshop finishes, we'll be setting up kind of maybe another meeting just about the working group 
and then there will be time to kind of for 10 15 people to get together and really kind of outline a bit more of the details of what's the scope and, and the goals uh of that working group yeah there i think uh, what you said about an intermediate language is sort of in in line with the the thing that won in in, in the poll uh right I mean, yeah, I guess the, the thing is like the, when you go from this the checking a thing in the exponent with the pairing, it's very clear it's R1CS. And, and now with these polynomial commitments, uh, there's so much uh, more options. And uh, yeah, it's more, uh, call it, uh, more complex to maybe, uh, yeah. Because the, these, these systems tend to be um, universal, but only up to a point because, um, you have to, so, so for Tevo Plunk, for example, you have to decide on a set of gates and then, um, uh, I, I guess maybe you can still use the same at SRS, um, regardless of which gates you're using. Uh, yeah. Uh, in terms yeah. of trusted setup, you, yeah, you, you do need to pre -pro re, like, do a pre-process, but not a trusted one. On the other hand, that there's another um, sense in which you you need to trust cryptographers to design your um, system of gates, um, and that's a different skill set than um, just applying the gates, I guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a different context, um, different, different trust model. Um, I just wanted to just, just further, I, I do like the idea of, of trying to think about like an uh, interview language or a common set of operations that you can then, that compilers can then optimize for different proving systems. Because I think there's a lot of scope there for, for the useful work. Specifically like trying to find the intersection of basically what, the way, the way that I was thinking this could work is, what is this like a set of uh, like micro rock codes um, that is broad enough to cover pretty much everything that you'd want to do in a SNARP and is, like the smallest, like the, 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 as fine grained as you can get while still preserving the ability to optimize an opcode for both R1 CS and polynomial based commitment schemes. I was, I was thinking things like, uh, I want to add two little code points together, or, you know, I want to, I want to read something from a lookup table. Um, but I think that's probably, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I'm getting into the reason. Yeah. Um, so that, that would kind of be a, a layer on top of R1 CS and, what I uh, was thinking that this working group would produce. Um, so what would this working, so what are the kind of things that you think we, you'd like to come out of this group? Um, so um, a way of describing a kind of meta circuit. So, so in Tevo Plunk, that would be the set of gates, the, um, the, uh, the number of wires, the how many of those wires are um, participate in the permutation argument, um, uh, how many rows the gates can access, and so on. Um, so, a way of describing that, and then um, uh, deriving a cost model that would tell you the the cost of any circuit using that meta circuit. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, yeah, that seems, that seems, um, that seems useful. Okay. I think, we, or we might want to make it more general than just have a block. If I could uh, add something on the, the, the addition to generalization on table Planck. obviously using such a meta language or the creating one, sorry, as part of the working group, it's directing the, the work that, that Ariel spoke about today and the, and the proposition into sort of credit side alignment of having something general. So when you have this cost model, because there are things in the R1CS circuits that would be uh, harmful to, to polynomial um, using schemes such, such as Plonk, I think it's important to inform the user, whoever interoperates with the language, what is the, the, the most optimal way of constructing between the two and, for example, explain the omission of things that would harm a polynomial equipment scheme if it's coming from an R1CS base. 
in order to get it as, as general and well, not general, but as universal as is possible. So, so I think the naive translation between um, R1CS and say TurboPunk or vice versa is quite inefficient, but um, it's not that hard a compilation problem because um, in Plunk, say there, there are efficient ways to do um, to add up lots of things in a linear combination, for example. Um, they they just require you to arrange the gates differently. Um, so it's not. Yeah, the, the fact the fact that we don't currently have tools to do it doesn't mean it's not a mechanizable problem. So one thing we found, for example, was that depending on how you compose your gates and which order do you pick, you can assemble, for example, sometimes two gates in just one by using the selector wire polynomial sometimes when you know that this value will be always the same. And these kind of things sometimes are quite tricky to grasp and you really need to understand what are you doing, what are the purposes of what you are doing, and how Plong works in, inside, of, I mean in the deep, to really so that, grasp these kind of optimizations. So, so what I think we need to do is um, abstract that from the details of how the cryptography works um, so that you just have a, um, uh, like I say, an, an intermediate language. Um, and that language has some, um, can be tweaked in various ways. Um, but we know how to compile sort of any instance of it into um, a, a range polynomial protocol or whatever. Yeah, I think that maybe one of the first steps that has been already taken on that is that actually TurboPlong is providing you functions to basically uh, do the most typical operations inside of rank one constraint systems. Yeah. Or however you want to call it. So basically these operations are already optimized and the program memory that they produce, for example, on the range constraint gate or on the logic on the XOR gate or stuff like this, it's quite optimal, I would say. So I don't know if the base point where we should start is, okay, we have these functions, so we build a program on the top of that, or we want to basically go from the go from scratch and basically grab every single thing and try to optimize it as much as we can inside of, of the program memory directly, not passing by so the, that, that latter thing seems to be the, the purview of a new proof system designer um, rather than something we can standardize right now. But um, Yeah, I, I think we um, the this we've got um, enough to work on that we can um, I think just having the right people together thinking about it um, will be able to make progress. Yeah. Also, yeah, I think I agree on that. It, it makes sense for us. Yeah, go for it. One of the annoying things, at least that we have found, is uh, when we provide addition and multiplication gates for the user, uh, you need to provide like the option to them to set the QC selector polynomial, for example, and also to input the public inputs. So also they can scalate the variables by using QL and QR and also QO. So at the end, you are requiring them like eight or nine inputs in just one function to just do one addition. And yeah, at some point, it's useful because it allows you to optimize a lot of stuff. But at the same time, it's kind of awkward that you need to input it's, a lot of stuff to do an addition. It's, it's, um, it's not the cleanest of models okay, compared to, say, R1CS. Um, I agree. I've, I've tried to uh, optimize um, Planck programs, and there are, there are lots of degrees of freedom. 
um, which is nice in a way because uh, you, you, if you want to do all of the low level optimizations, you, you can. Um, but on the other hand, the, there's a lot of space between the naive way of doing um, something and the, the fully optimized way of doing something, which is, um, I think, less the case for Owen's yes. Yeah, but right, I mean, it's in the example you said, I think, right, it's easy to define a, right, a default. Like, or you could say that the default addition oh, yeah. is like uh, QL is one, QR is one, I guess the, the other one, uh, Q, one of them is minus one, the rest are zero, right? I mean, so I think it's great right, for the user who just wants an addition gate, you can uh, you can easily define the defaults and, and they just need to say what are the addition right. inputs and outputs. Right, but it, but there's about a factor of I don't know ten performance between, say, me or Zach or you optimizing a Planck circuit and just using that. And I guess that's the problem that we are still living in a very very performance constrained world that makes it very difficult to build the layers on top. Yeah, because that's that's what we've always been doing in 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 IT that you you lose optimization by building layers on layers on layers and but you can uh, and then you and then you you claw back some of that optimization by just um having a lot lot of smart people write compilers um, but yeah it's but compilers have bugs and you in, in this context especially you need to be able to to be sure that um the optimizations that your compiler are doing is uh, it's correct yeah, I think that's that's very very valid, and it, uh, the, the the kind of the clunkiness of Plonk very much is a side effect of the kind of the the quest for performance in a in a regime where right now proof constructions for complex circuits is still relatively slow, um, and it is also based it is it is like Plonk was designed very explicitly around the KZG10 scheme and the implicit assumption that pre-process pre-computer selector polynomials are extremely cheap for the prover to integrate into their um, circuit proofs. So you basically, the, the idea is you shove as much stuff as you can to the selector polynomials so that the prover doesn't have to compute on the fly and commit to it. Um, but then, that, yeah, that just that gives you a, a lot of information you have to process to, to just to do a simple basic operation like an addition. Yeah. yeah. Then you will have the possibility, which is what we end up doing, but we are not sure about it, which is provide like three different functions to perform an addition. So you have the fun in three option, the fun in four option, and the option that basically allows you to touch whatever thing you, you want, which would be like the polynomial gate, we called it. Yeah, so, we did the same. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, in some way it works, but obviously if someone that understands what's going on types the same circuit that someone that it's just calling addition gates that are have all of the selector polynomials preceded to one or zero or whatever it is, the, the performance difference is going to be quite huge at the end if the program is quite hard or quite big. Yeah, yeah I, I, said a fact, uh, I said a factor of 10 before, but it's probably actually more than that. But, but, but isn't that, I mean, uh, is that really unusual? Like, isn't that the case with the C, C++ programming? Uh, also, the difference between the... I guess the problem is we can't afford the abstraction layers, whereas you can in C++. Like we're, we're kind of living in a world where, like, where, like where computing was in 1960, where the idea of running a compiler on your code um, was was a bit crazy because um, your your Fortran program is going to be a lot slower than just like a, you know, like manually poking holes in a punch card with a swing needle. But do I mean isn't it good for job security? Like what? Uh, why are, why are, you, are you so <laughs> disappointed? So, so I think if we were just talking about performance, then um, it, it would be kind of fine. But we're talking about both performance and security. So, so um, if you do the optimizations, then you have to spend a lot more effort proving that they're correct. Um, and with the possibility of making mistakes, um, and if you don't do the optimizations, then you may end up with a, a protocol that isn't practical. Um, so that, that trade-off is a lot starker than um, it is in the non-CK proof world. Uh, 
Uh, how are we for time, by the way? Oh, I think we're. I think so we're over we're, time. We're a bit over Quite time. Quite a bit. And I haven't stopped the recording just because I think the the conversation is very relevant and interesting. I mean, we've seen people drop off little by little, but usually the best conversation happens in a smaller group. So we just miss the beers, and then. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish I could send you all with a package a beer too. You know. Um, but again, I mean, you know, if if people want to continue the conversation, feel free. I mean, um, unless people kind of want to break off and I'll just stop the recording and then whoever wants to stay informally to continue speaking, that's also fine. Yeah, I, I think since we're 20 minutes over time okay. now, then we should stop the recording. So anybody want to say last words but, for the um, recording? So, so thank you very much to the speakers um, and uh, Daniel and all of the organizers. And thank you, Dara and Riyadh uh, for, for moderating. Uh, and the note taker, um, sorry, thank you. Awesome, stopping the recording now. Yeah.